For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bob Adderman. I'm a professor in the philosophy department here at Pitt. And it's my uh, really great pleasure to introduce uh, my new colleague, relatively new colleague, David Wallace to the PQI community. David is uh, the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of History and Philosophy of Science, as well as the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of Philosophy here at Pitt, uh, which is um, pretty a pretty amazing thing. On the other hand, uh, it does seem to require him to go to two sets of department meetings, which I don't think is a very good thing. Prior to coming to Pitt, David taught for three years at the University of Southern California. Um, and before that, he was professor at Oxford University, where he taught for almost, or about 17 years, I guess. Oxford is also where he received his two PhDs, the first in atomic and laser physics in 2001, and the second in philosophy in 2010. David's interests are in the philosophy of physics. He's published widely on, the, on, on quantum field theory, on the nature of probabilities in quantum physics, and on the foundations of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. His best known work, I think, is on the so-called many worlds or Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. And in 2012, he published a book entitled The Emergent Multiverse, Quantum Theory According to the Everett Interpretation with Oxford University Press. That book won the extremely prestigious Lakatos Award in 2013. And that award is given annually for, quote, an outstanding contribution to the philosophy of science of white philosophy of science widely interpreted, interpreted in the form of a book published in English during the current year or in the previous five years. So I think we're extremely lucky to have uh, been able to recruit David to Pitt, University of Pittsburgh. Um, and um, uh, I take it that this is a, a nice way to welcome him here. Um, the talk today is entitled, What is Orthodox Quantum Mechanics? Thank you. David. Thank you for the invitation and thanks Bob for that very generous introduction. Um, I should say many, many things drew me to the University of Pittsburgh. I'm afraid the, we the weather was not one of them from Southern California, but um, <laughs> it's worth putting up with the other advantages. Let me just see if I can share the screen here. Um, um, okay. Okay, is that? Yeah, we can see that. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's this term orthodox quantum mechanics that comes up in discussions of the foundations of quantum mechanics, discussions of how to interpret quantum mechanics. Um, and it's normally kind of a hate term, it's like um, <clears throat> orthodox quantum mechanics has these profound problems. Unlike orthodox quantum mechanics, uh, such and such interpretation of quantum mechanics solves the quantum measurement problem. Uh, this theory differs from orthodox quantum mechanics in such and such a way. Uh, conversely, on you know, the, the more defensive context one runs into the term, it's like, well, orthodox quantum mechanics uh, has these enormous predictive successes. Any interpretation of quantum mechanics must recover the successes of orthodox quantum mechanics. The term gets bandied around quite a lot. Um, and one of the things that became increasingly clear to me thinking about uh, interpreting quantum mechanics and just working with quantum mechanics over the last five or 10 years is that what the term means is a bit of a movable feast. Because the first thing you naturally do is you go to the textbooks and you say, well, what does textbook quantum mechanics look like? What do we teach our students? But it's one of the things that's become, you know, been pretty clear to philosophy of science for quite a while that textbooks don't tell the whole story and it's even more clear to any practicing scientist that textbooks don't tell the whole story. And what I want to convince you of today is that um, two things you standardly find in the presentation of textbook quantum mechanics just aren't really part of quantum mechanics as we use and practice it. Now my, my sort of slightly cynical description of what philosophers of physics sometimes do is that we tell physicists things they already know and then tell them it's profound. Um, so there's a sense in which um, I kind of expect that um, a lot of uh, what I say here is stuff that you'll you'll kind of recognize as I say it. But I think there's sometimes a value still in, in, in sort of making explicit various things that are sort of part of tacit understanding but don't make it up to, uh, to, to being explicitly recognized. And I think the, the, the features of orthodox quantum mechanics I want to focus on today, the, the, quanta, the 
of collapse of the wave function and the eigenvector eigenvalue link, uh, although I'm going to claim these are things that don't really show up in the practice of physics, they show up a great deal in the, the pedagogy of physics and they kind of colour people's impression of what quantum mechanics is in a way that you can take some substantial while to unlearn. So if there's a, if there's a contribution that, that this work makes, it may, it may be as much pedagogical as anything else. I hope to give people who teach quantum mechanics maybe something to think about as to what the best ways are of communicating the subject to our students in a way that uh, makes it easier for them to really connect with what's going on when we use this the, the theory in, in application. So let me just uh, start off with um, material that should be common ground to pretty much everyone here. There's a core of quantum mechanics that I'm not going to challenge that I, that I agree is part of the theory which you could roughly su summarize as saying something like the states of the, of the system are normalized vectors in some Hilbert space, the physical quantities for the system correspond in some vague sense to the self-adjoint operators on that Hilbert space, there's a dynamics on that Hilbert space given by the Schrodinger equation uh, which links the time evolution of the system to the energy of the system. This is all common ground. You, you could debate whether you want to um, phrase that in terms of mixed states these days, um, but it doesn't really affect the um, structure of the story I want to tell. <clears throat> that, if you like, gives you the dynamics and the state-space structure of the theory. And of course, also we have a probability rule. Uh, philosophers tend to call it the Born rule. That, um, physicists more often just call it the probability rule, which of course just says, um, given a quantum state, given an observable you're measuring, uh, and given a projector onto an eigen subspace of that observable, you get the probability of a measurement outcome giving uh, the, that given eigenvalue as a result of the measurement by just sandwiching uh, the um, quantum state with that projector. So again, all of this is familiar old hat even to people. That much absolutely is part of quantum mechanics as we practice it. But if you start looking at, um, to some extent, discussions in the textbooks, if you start looking certainly at discussions on the foundations of quantum mechanics, you find two other principles that show up. Um, the first, uh, you, some, you might call collapse the wave function, you might call state vector collapse. It says something like, when we said the system evolves under the Schrodinger equation, we only told you half the story. That's how the system evolves if you don't measure it. But should you choose to measure it for your sins, then it'll do something different. It'll do something discontinuous, something indeterministic. It will spontaneously collapse into one of the um, eigenstates of the observably measured and the probability of it undergoing the collapse is going to be given by a probability rule that matches to the Born rule. So we only get away with using the Schrodinger equation when there's no measurements. When we make a measurement the system makes this sharp transition. And the second principle again philosophers call it the eigenvector eigenvalue link that terminology at least sometimes turns up in the physics literature. Um, it's a rule for ascribing properties to a system, uh, not simply making predictions about measurement outcomes. It says that sometimes systems have definite values of observables, sometimes they have indefinite values of the observables, and the necessary and sufficient condition to have a definite value of an observable is to be an eigenstate of that observable, and the definite value is the associated eigenvalue. And in fact, if you grant the eigenvector eigenvalue link and you grant the um, wave function collapse postulate, then you've, you can more or less skip pos um, positing the probability rule, the Born rule, as a separate rule, because you can basically say, um, this, uh, as soon as you make a measurement, the system collapses stochastically into one of the eigenstates um, according to the collapse rule. Uh, and then according to the eigenvector eigenvalue link, it now has the property um, yeah, it has the value of the, of the quantity being measured given by its eigenvalue. So if you assume that the measurement just returns to us the actually possessed property, then you've bypassed the Born rule entirely. So you could, if, if, you, if you wrote down an axiomatization of the theory that includes wave function collapse and the eigenvector eigenvalue link, um, then you could more or less dispense with putting the Born rule on the table. <clears throat> and these two last principles matter a lot in foundational discussions of quantum mechanics, because when people set, um, state some, the quantum measurement problem, it's very often stated in these terms. So here are two ways of stating the quantum measurement problem that you frequently see in the literature. Uh, one is by the eigenvector eigenvalue link. Um, 
take some macroscopic observable, something uh, something like the projector onto states where, where, where Schrodinger's cat is alive, um, then generically quantum mechanics predicts macroscopically indefinite states, states like that don't make sense. Uh, everyday properties like um, uh, apparatus pointers being here or cats being alive are not the kind of thing that are allowed to be indefinite. They ought to be definitely possessed or definitely not possessed. So insofar as unitary quantum mechanics um, predicts that states are macroscopically indefinite, then the theory doesn't make any sense. If you want to do it via the, the wave function claps route, this is the way that, for instance, Roger Penrose would set up the measurement problem. Then you want to say that there's something close to a contradiction in the dynamics of quantum mechanics. We start off by saying the system obeys the Schrodinger equation. Then we say, oh no, it doesn't obey the Schrodinger equation when we make a measurement. And then you start worrying about, well, what physical processes count as measurements? Uh, how does the universe know that some given complex interaction is a measurement and should trip the state vector collapse rule? Uh, or how does, it, yeah, how does it distinguish that from just one other, another complex interaction of one system with another? Um, <clears throat> John Bell has this line that you know, did the first measurement occur when the first um, primeval life form came out of the oceans or did we have to wait till it got more evolved? Did we have to wait till the first person was granted a PhD before the first actual measurement was made? There's something very ill-defined in the way the theory is set up. That's the other standard route you get to the measurement problem. <clears throat> so what I wanna argue is that neither the eigenvector eigenvalue link nor state vector collapse deserve to be thought about it, thought of as part of orthodox quantum mechanics. And I want to be clear that I don't mean by that, I think those principles should be rejected by the correct interpretation of quantum mechanics. I, I don't mean that uh, we should be driven to remove those things from orthodoxy because they're unsatisfactory. I think they are unsatisfactory as it happens, but the claim I want to make is in some ways more modest, in some ways less so, it's more that, they, that those aren't actually part of orthodox quantum mechanics in the first place. If by orthodox quantum mechanics we mean what we actually do in the practice of quantum mechanics. <clears throat> and I'm going to argue for, the, for that um, uh, in reverse order. I want to start by talking about state vector collapse and then I want to talk about the eigenvector eigenvalue link. Now once I've done that, I want to say something about what, uh, what I think the right construal of orthodox quantum mechanics is. Uh, and how we want to think about the quantum measurement problem and the remaining conceptual, philosophical, foundational and clarities of quantum mechanics in the light of that starting point. So let me say uh, why I think wave function collapse, state factor vector collapse is not sensibly thought of as part of the, um, uh, the orthodox structure of quantum mechanics. Um, I, I should say actually, um, Jenny, I'm not sure I know what the window of time for the talk is. What's my time window? I, I think we usually go with 50 minutes, but you know, if discussion interrupts, we- Yeah, that, okay, that, that's roughly what I was planning for. Great, so, sudden realization, if it was a 25 minute framework, then I, I, I want to up, up my game slightly. Okay, so I mentioned that, um, you know, if you look at the textbooks, you will indeed very often find uh, the wave function collapse rule in your sort of first course in quantum mechanics textbook. I, um, I uh, obviously not, I didn't, I didn't do this before this um, session because of the pandemic, but uh, previous time when I've talked about this material, I just went through the various quantum mechanics textbooks on my shelf. My unscientific survey says that about half of them have wave function collapse as an explicit axiom. And it's probably fair to say that those half were the more conceptually, mathematically rigorous half. And certainly you see wave function collapse explicitly in in Dirac, you see it explicitly in von Neumann. If you think about those as the, the sort of the founding tomes of the subject, then it's, it's certainly in the, the sort of first course in quantum mechanics structure. You, um, you don't so often see it in um, the second course in quantum mechanics. Uh, in particular, as soon as you open a book on relativistic quantum mechanics, you generally see no, neither high, head nor tail of collapse. Um, and this confused me as an undergraduate because um, I remember being puzzled about the quantum measurement problem and thinking as you do that it's going to be strange to think how instantaneous collapse can happen in a relativistic theory which has um, relativity of simultaneity, conventionality of simultaneity, and was quite interested to see when I, when, I, when I supposedly read the axioms of quantum mechanics in a relativistic quantum mechanics book, uh, how it would state the Clatz postulate. 
And I was kind of surprised to find that the first textbook on relativistic quantum mechanics I looked at just didn't bother to state the class postulate. And nor did the second textbook on relativistic quantum mechanics. And 25 years later, I have still to read a textbook on relativistic quantum mechanics that tells you what the class postulate is. I don't mean by that that there's something like difficult or problematic about, about a collapse rule uh, that's stated in a relativistic theory. Um, of course there is. Um, like obviously there's a tension between wave function collapse uh, happening instantaneously across space and the idea that, inst that instantaneous is a reference to independent notion. What I mean more is you don't even find the unsatisfactory collapse postulate in the textbooks. Um, which is to say that somehow the application of relativistic quantum mechanics clearly gets by perfectly happily without stating any kind of class rule. You know, relativistic quantum mechanics makes a lot of use of the probability rule. Uh, that, you know, there's, there's no question that calculating the probabilities of various outcomes, usually um, scattering outcomes, is all over the, um, the, the, te the textbooks here, but you don't find a claim about collapse. So that's a first piece of what you might call indirect evidence that maybe claps can't be doing, can't be playing a central role in the way, uh, way we actually use physics in practice. A second bit of um, indirect evidence comes from the fact that for, for getting on 50 years, the quantum gravity community or, or the part of it that cares about high energy, that comes out of high energy physics has been tearing its hair out about um, uh, whether the evaporation of black holes is a unitary process or not. Um, and, um, you know, there was an article in, just, you know, just came out in, 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 in popular science making, this last week, making the, the, the latest claim that now, now we think we understand that black hole evaporation is a unitary process, that they didn't use that language, of course, but that's what it comes to. It's been obsessively significant um, for quantum gravity theorists to understand whether and how black hole evaporation is unitary. And if you think wave function collapse is part of quantum mechanics, then that's kind of puzzling because if actually every time a measurement, whatever that is, happens, the wave function collapses, then dynamics was never unitary anyway. Dynamics was a mixture of unitary and non-unitary processes. And it wouldn't obviously seem that mysterious that um, wave function, that um, some of the non-unitary bits should show up in something as exotic as the evaporation of black hole. So one can read off indirectly again from the fact that uh, quantum gravity theorists are so concerned about this that their picture of quantum mechanics doesn't have these none these um, temporary violations of unitarity as part of it. Third indirect piece of evidence, um, again if one does uh, quantum field theory one finds the theory very quickly gets reformulated in terms of path integrals and sums some over histories approaches and again that framework works just fine to solve Schrodinger's equation, it works just fine to read off probabilities a la the Born rule, it's not at all simple to see how you'd state collapse in the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics and more to the point you never in fact see it stated. So again it seems that one can do all of the physics we want to do with um, uh, with quantum field theory in a formalism that just doesn't seem to have a space in it naturally for the class posture. Okay, but all of that's kind of what you might call indirect evidence. Um, skip over the slide description of that. Um, we can also see sort of in more direct contexts, specifically the context where we actually try to model the quantum measurement process, uh, that collapse doesn't seem to be playing a significant role. And this is a place where I think um, it really shows that we understand the process of quantum measurement much better than we did, say, in Ball's day or Heisenberg's day or Dirac's day. Um, we're a long way past the point to which measurements had to be cashed out in classical language uh, and our interpretation of what the measurement processes were was done by a classical physics. So the design of measurement processes nowadays is quantum through and through, and we need to apply quantum mechanics to the study of the measurement process itself. And when we do so, um, we find, I'll, I'll try to demonstrate, that uh, there really is not a lot of space for something like the dynamical non-unitary collapse move. So let me catch some of that out. So the, the first example is a slightly um, cheeky move in a sense. Um, it's when it's thinking about how we make repeated measurements. And this is kind of odd because um, anyone who remembers their Dirac is uh, understanding repeated measurements correctly is actually one of the arguments Dirac makes that we do need to have a collapse of the wave function. So you know, Dirac wants collapse in, in this textbook description because it, it's necessary to ensure that repeated experiments always give the same result. So if I, 
if I have a state that say one over root two spin up plus spin down, um, and I measure it in the in in, in the it's the z direction let's say I, me I measure its spin and i get the measurement result up if i leave the quantum state alone in that process then the next measurement is 50 percent likely to get the result down if i want to guarantee that the two consecutive measurements of spin both give the answer up or both give the answer down then says the act i'd better collapse the wave function between those processes to make sure it works out so the only problem with that kind of argument is it had better not be the case that we have a reliable ar argument that um, uh, repeated measurements always give the same results, because repeated measurements don't always give the same results. In fact, trying to uh, carry out measurements that, um, so trying to build measurements that always give the, that give the same result on repetitions is pretty damn hard. Uh, it's, it's, it's little over crude, but not dramatically over crude to say that the standard method for measuring something in physics is to take the system you want to measure, slam it really hard into another system and then look at the, look at the detritus. Uh, if you think about um, something as simple as a stern girl -like experiment, then normally you measure where the particle is by slapping it into a screen and seeing what the uh, result is. Where the particle might be after the measurement um, is uh, entirely enough matter. Uh, it is the case that we know sometimes how to build um, uh, what you might, you know, non-disturbing measurements, measurements that do give the same outcome in multiple runs, but it's hard and it's a special case. So how do we work out in practice how a re whether a real measurement process gives the same results on, on a repetition? The answer is basically you model the measurement process physically, either schematically or in more detail. You introduce another quantum system to represent the measurement device and you let it get entangled with the first system and you don't touch anything. Uh, Can I interrupt you here for a second? Yeah, sure. Uh, I distinguish repeating an experiment and repeating a measurement. So could you just define what you mean more precisely here? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I cannot to the point. I mean, at some point you hit the fact that measurement's not a very well defined, well, not a precisely defined term. Um, so I, I mean, I mean it uh, in a, a loose sense that I've, I've, I've done some experiment which returns to me um, some value of the quantity I want to measure. Uh, perhaps say more about what you have in mind, because I'm not sure. I... Yeah, I think I'm asking a simpler question. Sure. Um, I could imagine measuring the Z component of, of uh, an electron and then measuring it again. Or I could imagine sending multiple electrons through the Z component filter. That's oh, what I call a re repeated experiment. I see what you mean. Sorry. Oh, okay, no, no. I, so, so, so I mean the same electron multiple times. I don't mean multiple repeats. Okay. All right, thank you. Sorry, I should be clear about that. Yeah, so, so if you, um, uh, this, is, this is where having, a, I, uh, having worked out how to use a virtual whiteboard in this setting would be helpful. So I'll just, I'll just sort of talk and hope you can visualize. If, if I imagine a measurement process that measures spin up, measures spin of, of my uh, spin half particle, the normal sort of model for that is something like after the measurement, the combined state of measurement device plus, um, uh, plus measured system is, a superposition of device read spin up particles in whatever state it's left after that, plus device read spin down particles in whatever state it is after that. If you then couple a second measurement device to that process and, 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 and run that again, then you're going to get the same outcome if and only if the process of measuring spin doesn't actually change the spin. So you might imagine a delicate measurement of spin where if I input a state, a state in spin up, and then my measurement device moves into a state that the registers spin up and my particle stays in spin up. Or you might imagine a more violent process where um, the measurement device ends up in the recording spin up state that the, the spin system gets put into some completely different state. Maybe it even gets, gets disrupted or maybe the process reliably dumps it into the spin down state. And if it's the first of those processes that's delicate enough not to leave the eigenstates, the lots change the eigenstates, then the second measurement process will deliver the same outcome. Uh, if, if, if the process messes with the electron, then the second measurement might deliver a different outcome. And the way we get at that process is that we absolutely, we absolutely better not collapse anything. If we apply the collapse rule, we're gonna cause a lot of confusion here. We wanna model the whole unitary Schrodinger process of first measurement device and second measurement device and particle, and then apply the Born rule to read off 
predictions as to how likely things are and see whether, for instance, the Bourne rule says it's 50% likely we'll get up twice, 50% likely we'll get down twice, and 0% likely we'll get uh, different results on the two measurements. Um, that's the way in which the process is going to tell us whether a real measurement is, um, <coughs> uh, is, uh, gives the same result on repetition or not. And it's just not a process we've got straightforward access to if we try to collapse the wave function willy-nilly as we do it. So that's the first example. Um, second example is, um, comes from the, 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 any measurement that you call continuously observing a system. So it's a sort of telling little uh, detail you see when you, um, uh, when you see physics discussions of the, of the measurement problem, and in particular when you see the Schrodinger cat thought experiment. If you recall, as, as Schrodinger originally set it up, uh, the situation is I have uh, a radio isotope, uh, I connect a Geiger counter to some cat killing device, uh, and then I wait some length of time equal to the half life of, well, just if I have one pot, what if I have one molecule in the half life of the isotope, if, if I've got a lot of the isotope, I, I wait long enough that there's a 50% chance of the Geiger counter having decayed. And then I come back and I see whether the cat's alive or dead. The way you see that modeled normally when you read a, a semi-technical discussion of it now is you replace the Geiger counter process with some kind of sharp discrete measurement like the particles one over root two spin up plus spin down and you measure spin. Um, presumably I think because the, the, um, the process of a continuous measurement is a, is a rather subtle thing to handle. But, but if we try to actually do, um, do, do a mathematical model of Schrodinger's actual thought experiment, well, radioactive decay has something like this quantum form. Um, I have a superposition of an undecayed state with an exponentially decaying coefficient, plus I have an integral over time of a, <coughs> excuse me, of a nominal continuum of different decay products, uh, each differently weighted. Uh, I should have checked the math of this beforehand, I apologize, it slipped slightly. Um, in other words, the superposition doesn't just contain two distinct states, it contains um, uh, a continuum of states corresponding to the continuum of different times at which the particle might have decayed. Now, if you ask yourself how you, um, how you plug measurement of whether it's decayed not, or not into that process, and you try simulating that with the Born rule, sorry, with the um, collapse rule, you get into trouble quite quickly. The, the Born rule applied to this works fine. If you were to look at this system and ask, what's the probability after some time t that it's decayed, that it's undecayed, say, uh, take the mod squared amplitude of the undecayed state, uh, you get the familiar exponential decay rule. But if you want to actually apply wave function collapse, if you want to say, when I measure the system, uh, I get a, um, uh, I collapse the wave function, uh, it's not so clear what the right thing to do is. Um, I could discretize, I can imagine, let's look at the system once every second and apply the collapse rule each time I do that. Uh, but I wasn't looking at it once every second. The Geiger counter doesn't just sort of cycle on and off again on uh, one second intervals. I'm looking at the system continuously. I could try taking um, a continuum limit of uh, discrete measurements, but as I should think most people here know, if I do that, I get out, I Zeno freeze the whole system. Uh, the, um, the, the, the limiting consequence of making a discrete series of measurements at shorter and shorter time intervals is that the system is just Zeno frozen into its initial state and the Hamiltonian evolution is entirely suppressed. And in fact, if you look at Mr. and Sadarshan's original paper on the quantum Zeno effect, they represent the effect as a paradox for precisely this reason. They're, they're coming in from a mathematical physics starting point. They're just taking the axioms of quantum mechanics as given. They're saying the right way to measure, to model continuous measurement needs to be as the continuum limit of discrete measurements. They demonstrated freezing and they say, well, this is paradoxical. There's something, <coughs> something problematic about the foundations of the subject. And what became apparent over the next few years of work on it was that there isn't a paradox here. You just need to model a continuous measurement process um, as a unitary evolution of a measuring system. And if you take some physical system such that if you input an undecayed uh, particle, it doesn't do anything. And if you input some decay products, it transitions into a recording state. Uh, and you just couple that to the continuously decaying particle. 
what you find is that um, what replaces the discrete time interval between measurements um, is the response time of the apparatus. And if the time it takes the, the modeled Geiger counter to recall the decay is long compared to some of the internal time scales of the decay process itself, um, then the device passively records the exponential decay. Um, and if it's short compared to it, then I Xeno freeze the process and I could go smoothly over from Xeno frozen to non Xeno frozen dynamics as I turn down the response speed of the measurement device. <clears throat> so the modeling of the measurement process is fine, but the modeling of the measurement process requires you to put collapse aside. Uh, it requires you again to treat the whole thing unitarily and then just use the Born rule to read off the predictions at the end of the story. And the last, um, the last example I'll just give of um, how I think direct practice in physics doesn't, um, doesn't square with using the collapse rule very much is um, uh, the increasing use of the PAVM, positive operator value measurement framework to replace the sort of Dirac von Neumann projection value measurement approach. So we're increasingly used to the idea that if you want to model various kinds of unsharp measurements, then we need to introduce a PAVM. If I want to measure model, say, simultaneous measurements of position and momentum, uh, Dirac von Neumann would say, well, position and momentum don't commute. So there is no such thing as a, as a simultaneous measurement of position and momentum. Now we're much more inclined to say, you're welcome to measure position and momentum simultaneously. Uh, the price for doing so is that your measurement of both will be imprecise. Uh, we know how to model that mathematically perfectly well. Uh, we can uh, tie all of that uh, to both to experiment and to study of the quantum classical transition. But there's no very natural collapse rule that you can associate with PAVM. I mean, I mean there's some you can write down if you want them, but um, there's a fair amount of kind of free choice how you want to do it. And again, it seems pretty clear if you really want to know what state the system is in after PAVM, what matters is how was the PAVM implemented. Uh, and again, the way we get at that is we don't collapse the wave function. It's all Schrodinger equation all the time. Uh, and we just treat the, treat the measurement system as part of our, our larger whole. OK, so that's the case that we're not actually using wave function collapse in our practice of physics. If we were using it, it would be getting us into a lot of trouble in measurement contexts. We're not getting into trouble. Um, uh, we avoid getting into trouble um, by treating everything as unitary, by applying the Born rule when we want to get predictions out, um, by not collapsing anything. Let me talk now about the eigenvector eigenvalue link. So here the case has a slightly different structure. You, you, find, you find this as a principle less often explicitly stated in the textbooks. Um, it's more something that uh, philosophers tend to regard as part of the stating of quantum mechanics. But you can at least make the case that it's, it's a, a tacit assumption in at least a, a number of the, the presentations of the subject. So here's a, a starting point in seeing why, if you, if you really take it literally, then something like that eigenvector eigenvalue link can't really be part of how we do in physics. And, and the case here comes from thinking about position measurements or just the position property. Um, so, so as most people here will know, uh, I can decompose the position observable in this form. Its eigenstates are improper. They don't live in a Hilbert space. Mathematically speaking, we think of them as something like a distribution. Um, <clears throat> So a system can't have a perfectly definite value of position. Um, a, a Dirac delta function is not the kind of quantum state a system can be in. Uh, if, if, we, if we think that the physically possible states are the Hilbert space states, then the position eigenstates aren't Hilbert space states, so they're not possible states for the system. Um, so no particle according to the eigenvector eigenvalue link could have a perfectly definite position. That's not a problem in itself. Um, we know that we can, you know, I mean, uh, von Neumann recognized this, Dirac recognized this. Um, we can construct perfectly well behaved operators of this kind of form by integrating over um, uh, some, uh, some region sigma. Or we can <coughs> applying the eigenvector eigenvalue link to that kind of operator, we can say uh, a system is definitely located in region sigma 
if and only if it's an eigenstate of this op of this operator lambda sigma with uh, eigenvalue one, it's definitely not located in sigma uh, if it's an eigenstate with eigenvalue zero. It's indefinite whether or not it's located in sigma uh, if neither of those two holds. I'm just going to take a moment to get a glass of water. Excuse me. So there's a minor problem here and a more major problem. So the, the minor problem is, again, as a matter of physics practice, if we want to represent localized states, we don't represent them as functions that have support inside uh, some certain region. The kind of canonical way in physics to represent a fairly localized state is to use something like a Gaussian. So if I have a Gaussian with half width A um, and center X zero, we normally say, look, the particle is localized around x0, it's localized in a region of width approximately a around x0. But of course, according to the eigenvector eigenvalue link, this thing's got tails everywhere. Gaussians are never exactly zero. So according to the eigenvector eigenvalue link, the position of the Gaussian particle is completely indefinite. <clears throat> well, maybe that's not a huge problem. Um, after all, uh, in Hilbert space norm, uh, such a Gaussian is going to be extremely close to some function that genuinely has compact support on a region uh, of width a few times the half width around the centroid of the Gaussian. So maybe this is just pragmatic. Gaussians are easier to work with than functions of compact support. Maybe we're just going to work with Gaussians because calculation is simpler. Um, but what we really have in mind for a localized particle is a particle whose support actually lies in a region. <laughs> Well, the major problem is that's not dynamically viable. Wave, wave packets spread out instantaneously. If I take a particle that's localized in some region sigma by this definition of localized, it's not that a few milliseconds later it's localized in a larger region, it's that a few milliseconds later it's localized everywhere in space. Uh, you know, if I, want to, if I want the momentum space description of um, a particle with a given uh, wave function, I Fourier transform. The Fourier transform of a compact support function is analytic. Uh, analytic functions vanish, well, not literally nowhere, but only on isolated zeros. Uh, so the, um, uh, in, in momentum space, my compact support um, quantum state uh, is a superposition including arbitrarily large values of momentum. So kind of on intuitive physical grounds, it's pretty clear to see it's going to be, um, it, it's going to spread arbitrarily far or have some amplitude to spread arbitrarily far. And you can turn that rather hand-waving uh, physical argument into a rigorous mathematical argument that uh, for the free particle, <coughs> free particle Hamiltonian and indeed for any Hamiltonian that doesn't perfectly confine the system to a box of infinite potential walls, the wave function spreads out instantaneously. And by the way, even considering um, relativity doesn't help you with this, on, on natural ways of writing particle descriptions of relativistic particles, you still get this um, instantaneous spread. How, how you want to reconcile that with um, causality is a, a whole other story and a whole other talk, but short answer, it, it, it doesn't get you out of the problem here. So we come to the conclusion that no, <clears throat> no free particle, or in, indeed no particle in a, a well-behaved potential, however macroscopic it might be, even if the particle is the Earth, is ever at all localized in position according to the eigenstate eigenvector link, except for at most one instant. And so in pragmatic terms, any notion of localization that turns on that kind of idea of what it is to be localized is not useful to us. And you can strengthen and generalize this. Um, here's a mathematical theorem I'll state that proof. Suppose I've got a system revolving under Hamiltonian under Schrodinger's equation. Suppose, as is generally physically pretty unproblematic, that the Hamiltonian of the system spectrum is bounded below, there's a lowest energy value. Then if I take any projector, indeed any project positive operator, uh, one of these two conditions holds. So the first condition says um, the expectation value of that operator with respect to the quantum state of time t is non-zero for almost every time. Uh, and the exception cases are nowhere dense. So in other words, except for some isolated discrete set of times, uh, then the expectation value is never zero. 
Or the other possibility is the expectation value is exactly zero and is exactly zero all the time. Well, given a result of that kind, if, um, uh, if I have some property represented by some projector pi, then there's two possibilities. Uh, I put this one badly. Um, uh, sorry, I've, I've, I'm actually looking, looking at the wrong slide. So let me, let, me, let me say in words what I want to say here. There's two possibilities. Um, either that property is definitely not possessed at all times, or at almost all times it's indefinite whether the property is possessed, or, or it's not. It's not definitely not possessed. I should say. In other words, for any given property, there's almost no information conveyed by telling me whether that property is definite or indefinite at various times. It's, um, it's either it's always definitely not possessed or always definitely possessed, or, um, or it's basically indefinite essentially all the time. So notions of definiteness or indefiniteness, if we're reading them off strictly according to the eigenvector eigenvalue link, can't be doing any work that's useful in the practice of physics. We might want to use something that's a rough and ready approximation of it. We might find it useful to say a system has an approximately definite value of such and such if it's roughly an eigenstate of such and such observable. Um, but that kind of thing is going to be a sort of convenient loose talk. It's not going to be something we can put into the formal axioms of the theory. Okay, so that's the main part of my talk done. I've, hope, I've, I've tried to argue that the uh, wave function collapse and the eigenvector eigenvalue link are not things that we should think about as orthodox as part of orthodox quantum mechanics. Not in the sense that they're unsatisfactory principles, but simply that they're principles that we can't reconcile with the way we actually use quantum mechanics. All right, so what is orthodox quantum mechanics? That's what I want to finish by talking about. Well, here's my suggested way of thinking about it. Um, the dynamics is always unitary. Um, we never actually apply a non-unitary evolution to a closed system and treat it as dynamical. But the way we interpret the quantum state is equivocal in the way we use quantum mechanics. Sometimes we think of the quantum state as playing a representation rule. So, some, sometimes we think of quantum states as analogous to phase-based points in uh, in classical mechanics. So sometimes we think, uh, when I say uh, the quantum particle has state um, alpha spin up plus beta spin down, that's a statement of the same kind of form as saying the classical particle is located here. But sometimes instead we talk about a quantum state in probabilistic terms. Sometimes, sometimes when we describe a particle as uh, alpha this plus beta that, we interpret that as saying, we mean that it, it either has, it's either this or it's that, and it's got probability mod alpha squared being this, and it's got probability mod beta squared of being that. And sometimes, and here's the SOP that one wants to offer to the collapse of the wave function, in context where you're interpreting the quantum state probabilistically, sometimes we update it by probabilistic conditionalization. And that looks something like wave function collapse, um, but it's not a dynamical process. So those contexts in which we in which we say we're collapsing the wave function into the spin-up state or something, in our scientific practice, you want to think about that kind of move as analogous to the move just saying, well, we now know it's spin up, so we can disregard the possibility of it being spin down. But we don't want to think about that as a dynamical process. If we think about that as a dynamical, as, as, as actually happening dynamically in the context of larger quantum systems, we get into all of the sorts of travel I was sketching in the earlier part of the talk. So from that point of view, um, the central interpretive thing we're using is the Born rule. And the Born rule is basically all we need to be using in this kind of story. We, um, uh, we evolve the quantum state unitarily. Um, when we're doing uh, when we're not in, in context where we want to read out an answer, we can get away with interpreting the quantum state and talking about the quantum state as if it represents actually possessed properties. In context where we actually want to get concrete predictions out, we need to apply the Born rule and think about the state in more probabilistic terms. 
I mean, how do we know when we're to think about the quantum state in one or another of these, in, in, in one way or another here? Well, here's what it comes down to. The probabilistic reading of the quantum state and, and therefore the probabilistic way of thinking about the collapse of the wave function, that's untenable whenever you're doing interference. Um, if you want to say, um, uh, by quantum state, uh, alpha spin up plus beta spin down is either in the spin up state or the spin down state, but I don't know which. Um, then you're going to find that's incompatible with the normal way we want to talk about interference. The probabilistic reading on, by, by, um, by contrast is compulsory in measurement contexts and more generally in macroscopic contexts. If I want to use quantum mechanics to talk about um, how an actual measurement process eventually plays out, and I want to say, what am I actually going to see at the end of the process? Or is the cat going to be alive or dead when I look in the box? Then I need to think, to, to think about the state probabilistically. And that's going to be true even of uses of quantum mechanics where it's not, um, doesn't fit the sort of nice clean measurement process. Um, if you think about, say, using quantum mechanics to predict the probabilities of various radioactive decay processes, which then in turn plug into various biological processes, um, then you want to think about all that story in probabilistic terms. Um, you don't want to think, if, well, unless you want to be led down the siren route of the many worlds theory, which, which you should be, but that's another story, then you, uh, you'll need to think about that quantum state not as a weird indefinite state of all the possible decay outcomes and biological processes, but as a probability distribution over the various processes that can play out. And from that point of view, um, the, you know, <clears throat> probably the central um, theoretical advance in thinking about quantum measurement in the last 30, 40 years, the development of decoherence theory, explains to you why it is that interference doesn't matter in these latter cases. So de decoherence theory in its sort of consistent history formalism uh, gives us a criterion for when we can think of quantum evolution probabilistically, uh, and the various models, mostly of environment induced decoherence, tell it give us a mechanism for how that reading can be permissible. But in any case, decoherence tells us why it is that we never find ourselves in situations where um, where the probabilistic reading is both untenable and compulsory. Okay, so my, my, my suggestion is if we want to think about the content of quantum mechanics or, or, or as we use it in practice, this is the kind of shape of it. It's, it's formalism is the usual unitary formalism. Uh, its predictions come entirely through the Born rule. Um, our, inter our orthodox interpretation of it is a kind of equivocal, inconsistent interpretation where sometimes we interpret it representationally uh, sometimes we interpret it probabilistically, um, and we get away with it because of um, because of decoherence and because macroscopic and measurement processes uh, suppress interference in the places we need it suppressed. And I think um, if you like your statements of theories to be sharp and clean, then this all potentially looks a pretty unsatisfactory, even incoherent way of talking about quantum mechanics. And ultimately, I agree. I think this way of talking about quantum mechanics um, is unsatisfactory, it is incoherent. Um, that's the quantum measurement problem. So I, I want to suggest that the, the right way to think about the quantum measurement problem is it's this interpretative incoherence inside orthodox quantum mechanics. And what it is to solve the quantum measurement problem is, to, uh, is either to find uh, a univocal, coherent way of reading the quantum formalism, uh, whether that's a la Everett or a la physics is information or a la whatever your other preferred way of doing this, a la, a la uh, Griffiths Omni style consistent histories. I, I, either solving the measurement problem is that, or solving the measurement problem is modifying quantum mechanics to get a different theory that doesn't run into these sort of problems in the first place. And again, in a sense, perhaps that seems obvious, um, but it's, um, it's quite a long way from the, the way of stating the measurement problem uh, that we had at the beginning of the talk, where um, the problem is stated through the eigenvector eigenvalue link or through um, the Platts postulate. And I think what's going on here, and I'll just conclude with this thought, is that uh, people thinking about the foundations of quantum mechanics um, 
whether that's mathematical physicists uh, trying to state sharp versions of the measurement problem, or whether it's philosophers stating the measurement problem, kind of give um, give physicists both too much and too little credit. Um, something like the the picture of quantum mechanics with wave function claps isn't that philosophically unsatisfactory. It's got a quite unsatisfactory claps rule, but it's it's got a coherent interpretation. I can understand that theory reasonably well. I can just say it's dynamics are annoyingly underspecified. Um, we, un we understand what we're being told if we're told this is the content of the theory. What's unsatisfactory about the theory is sort of physical and dynamical. It's got a principle in it that just doesn't, isn't a good, isn't good physics and gets us into trouble. Um, the way of thinking about orthodoxy I've suggested here gets into much less physical trouble and is much more conceptually uh, incoherent. And I think um, people looking for sharp statements of the quantum measurement problem are kind of led to reformulate quantum mechanics in a way that makes it more conceptually clean in order before they even get going. So from, from that point of view, I, I would think about the, the, um, the dynamical, the, the, the collapse of the wave function principle as if you like a, th a sort of step towards solving the measurement problem, but, but a bad step, a, a mistaken step. Um, but the, 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 the quantum mechanics with the, with, with the collapse rule in there is a theory that you can, you know, you can univocally interpret that theory as, as you know, quantum states are not probabilistic inherently. The probabilities all come from the collapse law. I can understand the theory as telling me what the actual state of the quantum system is. It's just got a very ill-defined um, dynamical rule in it. But ill-defined dynamical rules get in the way of the practice of physics. I think we should be unsurprised to find that the right way to think about orthodoxy as it's practiced, uh, it, it, as, as physicists actually use it, is it something that's very well suited to the practice of physics and is perfectly happy to pay the price of leaving big conceptual incoherences for the later work in order to have something that we can, we can use to do physics. So I think I'll stop there, but there's a bunch of different uh, directions. Uh, I could take the discussion of that and I'll sort of see where we go in Q and A. Thanks very much. Thank you. There are questions people can uh, unmute. Feel free to ask. Uh, I have some questions and observations. Sure. <clears throat> the, first of all, I, I think I've met hundreds of quantum physicists and I can't think of any who think that collapse is a thing, mm. <laughs> uh, which agrees with your point of view, I think. <laughs> um, they, they, the impression I get is that uh, 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 of the attitude is that it's just a, a shorthand for very complicated quantum mechanical stuff that happens when you interact with macroscopic systems. Mm. And that piques my, your comment you made piques my interest with respect to that. And that's what's going on in the more advanced textbooks where they seem to ignore all this stuff. And I wonder if that's just sociology and people who write introductory textbooks feel obligated to explain the fundamentals of quantum mechanics and people who write advanced ones think you've already done it so we're not going to bother with that stuff um, not only that but quantum field theory has a really simple measurement problem you either are interested in masses or scattering amplitudes and this, so you know measurement and all of that ah that's just something that some experimentalist does and we don't even care about that um, so that, that was the comment part, although I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are. The question part is this. I was under the impression that if you take unitary evolution, born probability interpretation, and decoherence, that you could get a nice consistent definition of quantum mechanics. And you seem to be saying at the end there that that's not true. And I didn't understand that. Good. Okay, let, let me say something quickly in the comments and um, respond to the question. There's, there's lots to say here. So, I mean, my, my experience, again, absolutely meets yours, that um, quantum, quantum physicists I talk to don't think collapse is a thing. Um, a lot of people I talk to in physics and in philosophy think quantum physicists think collapse, think collapse is a thing. I mean, Roger Penrose thinks physicists think thinks, um, collapse is a thing, for instance. Most, about half the philosophers I talk to think physicists think collapse is a thing. Lots of undergraduates learning physics, and indeed lots of grad students learning physics, think physicists think collapse is a thing. 
and right. you can't really blame them because the textbook tell them it is. Um, so, so I'm kind of glad that um, uh, that that's the the, um, the, 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 the the observation you have because um, uh, it, it could kind of conf confirms my own amateur sociology, but I do think it's striking that it's kind of not obvious from the outside that that type of mechanics is, is working. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, uh, you're right, of course, in, in QFT, uh, to a large extent, the, um, the phenomenology, scattering phenomenology, I think I wouldn't get quite as far as to say that's entirely true now. I mean, partly uh, a lot of the applications of QFT we have these days are in solid state contexts where um, we're making, where we're, we're kind of looking at various kind of macroscopic properties and, and, and getting them out from the, the sort of kinetic theory you read off, but, but um, that's, a, that's like a minor quibble, I'm not really disagreeing with the point. Regarding the question, um, well, it kind of depends what your criteria are for, um, uh, for um, coherence, if you like. I mean, it's certainly true, if I, if I do just unitary quantum mechanics, I will find that macroscopically speaking, I mean, there's lots of promissory notes here, but the evidence seems pretty solid. Macroscopically speaking, I'll find that macro level processes end up being described in a way that's mathematically uh, has the form of a stochastic um, or dynamical process. Quantum interference gets kind of suppressed out. Um, ask yourself uh, how to think about that in a, cons in a, in a consistent way. And there are steps that need to be put in. So um, do we want to say, if I've, got, I've got some quantum state that's something like superposition one over root two uh, macroscopic level measurement process reads yes, plus macroscopic measurement process reads no. Um, do I interpret that quantum state as, as, as saying this quantum state is to be thought about like a statistical mechanical probability um, yeah, as, as a way of saying, well, maybe the outcome's up, maybe the, sorry, maybe the outcome's yes, maybe the outcome's no, this is the probability of one, this is the probability of the other, maybe I think about those probabilities in Bayesian terms or relative frequency terms or whatever your favourite way is. Um, if you do that and you say that's what quantum states are, and then you try to pull that reading into the microscopic, then of course it gets you into trouble. If I, if the quantum state I'm thinking about isn't a decohered state, if it's something like one over root two, particle goes along the left arm of the Mark's Ender interferometer plus one of root two particle goes on the right arm of the Mark's Ender interferometer. Well, if the particle definitely goes along the left arm, it's 50% likely to, um, to turn up at each detector. If it goes along the right arm, it's 50% likely to turn up at each detector. Therefore, I don't need to know which arm it goes along to predict that there's 50% likely to end up at each detector. But of course, that needn't be the case. There can be interference, which means it's 100% likely to end up at, at one of the detectors. So that kind of probabilistic way of interpreting the quantum state isn't viable at the microscopic level. Um, so, uh, and there isn't a particularly sharp point where you can say, this is where I change how I think about the quantum state. If, if there was such a point, it would sort of be a reintroduction into the theory of something like a collapse. Um, so the challenge to, um, to make sense, to say I've got a good interpretation is to say, given all those decoherence facts, um, does that point me to a, a consistent way of talking about what's going on? I mean, one answer, for instance, the one I played with a lot is that the you know, Everett's way of talking, where I say that strictly speaking, everything is a, is a superposition all the time, but those superpositions are undetectable in the macroscopic regime, but they're nonetheless still, still strictly speaking present. Um, that works fine. It has you know, expensive philosophical consequences. Um, something like the way people like Bob Griffiths talk about the um, uh, about the consistent histories formalism tries to say look cert certain things you cert you're, there are certain things you're not allowed to say outside a consistency context you're not allowed to talk about that, that, I mean Bob's here is incorrect on the way of putting this um, you're, you're only allowed to talk about things relative to a, a given um, uh, a given consistent history structure uh, that Possibly that, that possibly works as well as a way of thinking. Um, and then there are questions about whether we entirely understand what's being said when, when, when we say that these um, attributions of properties are relative to frameworks. So, so the, the short answer here is I think, um, uh, I think decoherence absolutely points us towards what kind of solutions to the measurement problem we might look for. Uh, I don't think in itself it solves the problem, except insofar as you want to say, 
something like Everett just is DJ Hamilton. I mean, if, although in more militant modes, I'd say the Everett interpretation is just is quantum mechanics interpreted literally in the presence of DJ Hamilton's theory, but that, that claim could be contested. Okay, thank you. Uh, could I ask a question of you, uh, David? Mm -hmm. The um, Imagine the following situation. I have a closed box, highly uh, evacuated vacuum inside, mm -hmm. but there's a radioactive nucleus at the center of it uh, with a decay time of, you know, several hours, but a bunch of detectors around. And then suddenly one of the detectors detects the decay. And my experimentalist friends will say, well, yeah, that's because the nucleus decayed a bit earlier and they tell you how long before the nucleus nucleus decayed. Do you have a sort of picture of what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, then the question is, how should we describe this quantum mechanically? Because for example, the nuclear decay process leads as you were showing just to some complicated wave function, uh, which doesn't go out in a particular direction. Say we have several detectors and one of them in a particular direction detected the particle. That's not sort of present in that initial, in that initial wave function. And uh, how is it that we can decide the time of decay? How do, how do we think about that? Yeah, okay. So, well, just give me a moment and I'll, um, I'll share my screen again so I've got this equation up. Um, just... Okay, so that was my um, sort of schematic of what the decay process looks like. But of course, if I've, if I've got a bunch of these detectors, I'm going to want to say that what my, that, that, that state I very schematically call decay products is some kind of spherical wave state. Um, and then if I want to add a bunch of detectors into this, I'm going to want to say my full quantum state, my, my full Hilbert space is the, the, rate, the decay plus decay products Hilbert space, tensor of the various Hilbert spaces of these detectors. Um, and the, the detectors are going to couple to the, um, to the decay products in a way that's spatially sensitive. So uh, I'm going to have the, with those things present, my, my second term in the superposition is going to be something like, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to decompose that state in turn into some superposition that looks something like decay products went that away, that detector went off, plus decay products went that away, that detector went off. And that's just going to come out again of doing the unitary analysis. But right. then when I say, okay, how do I want to read off empirical content from that, I apply the Born rule to it. Um, and it's going to come out from the formalism, uh, you know, assume there's only one decay product produced, so I don't have two detectors going off at once. It's going to come out from the formalism that with probability one, only one of the detectors is going to have gone off. Oh, sorry, at most one of the detectors is going to go off. Um, the, uh, in, in Everett terms, the relative state of all the other detectors conditioning on one of them having gone off will always be not gone off. Um, such, such, something like that, that's fairly schematic, but something along those lines. I, I mean, way back in the, the 20s, I mean, Mott has a paper that in some ways is, which you're probably aware of, is in some ways a precursor of decoherence, which more or less models this kind of situation. He has a bunch of kind of cloud chambers particles, and he thinks that how, how does a spherical wave translate to a direct line in the cloud chamber? And it, and it very much has this form. He, um, the system evolves into a superposition uh, of um, uh, cloud chamber excitations, um, where the superposition is rotationally symmetric, but it's a superposition of all of the different lines of excitation. Um, I, I think that's how I model it. it does, does that was that what you had in mind, or uh, there is the additional point that the decay takes place at a definite time. The detectors can detect the time of the decay. They include clocks. Yeah. And the experimentalist will say, well, uh, a few milliseconds before the detector's clock uh, triggered, yeah. uh, the particle decayed. Yeah. Uh, can you talk, can you, can you fit that into your system? Okay, good, yeah. I mean, well, I want to distinguish a little bit here between 
what I think we could say about it just in the orthodox language of quantum mechanics and what I think the right thing to say about it is, which probably brings a little bit more of my kind of interpretational prejudices in. I, I mean, the, 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 the formal quantum superposition is going to have a, um, a time index to it for each of the detectors. So it, I could certainly, it's certainly going to assign probabilities via the Born rule to a detector going off at a given time. If I want to talk about the particle before that happening, um, I think at that point, I'm, well, yeah, this is your territory more than mine, I'm going to want to use the Deacon, Deacon here in history's language. So uh, the, the various histories of the decay product are going to be mutually decohering, not, not because there's an environment um, playing a role, but just because um, a particle that's, that's going this way is not going to zag and interfere with a particle going that way. So I'm, I, I can put down a consistent histories description uh, that doesn't just talk about the detectors, but also does talk about what the part, what the decay products were doing uh, before the um, <clears throat> uh, before bef um, bef before the detection happens. And on the kind of line I, I was offering for orthodoxy at the end of the talk, I think I say, look, that's that's a context in which you can get away with talking about the quantum state probabil probabilistically. So you can do it if you like. Um, my, my, you don't have to do it, it's not compulsory for getting experimental results off, but it's, it's available and it's natural and it's licensed by, by the fact that the different particle histories mutually do here. I think it's actually a nice example of where, um, uh, where the environment induced way of thinking about decoherence doesn't capture the whole content of decoherence theory. Um, okay, thanks, uh, thank you for that. So um, Jeremy, Jeremy has typed a question, he can't talk apparently in this house because there's another talk going on so maybe it'd be david you could read the oh, chat yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm reading it now uh, <clears throat> issue of strange properties of x state is consequence having infinite kinetic energy you can get around that but it's by discretizing space yes so um so i agree of course that's right um uh in a sense that's a different way to my um uh um, to, to my talk about compact support regions, but let's talk in that terms. Let's suppose we, we have a discretized lattice of space. Um, uh, and let's suppose I prepare the system in an eigenstate of position on one of those points. So uh, if I've got a free particle Hamiltonian or, or most reasonable Hamiltonians, then the quantum state of the system an arbitrarily short time after it's prepared in that um, definite position state is gonna be a superposition of essentially all the position states. So the system is going to go, um, uh, it's going to go completely indefinite in position instantaneously. Now, of course, it's, um, uh, depending how you set the problem up, it might well still be very heavily peaked around a certain region. Uh, and that's going to return to you the fact that the, you know, the Born rule is going to say, if you look to where the particle is, it's almost certainly going to be really close to where it started. But it's still the case that the, um, the eigenvector eigenvalue link is going to be, um, uh, um, is, is, is going to say the system is completely indefinite. So that's the, that's the technical answer. Um, as far as the, the question about the connection to the conceptual framework, I mean, to be honest, um, in a, the, the, the case for saying, I, I, I'm saying that I thought wave function collapse tends to turn up as part of a textbook conception of quantum mechanics. It's probably fair to say that something like the eigenvector eigenvalue link shows up less as a textbook thing. It tends to show up more in certain foundational attempts to reconstruct quantum mechanics. Um, so uh, insofar as somebody wanted to say, look, I, our students never thought this was part of quantum mechanics in the first place. I don't recognize this as, a, uh, as something they, they, they come across, even in the way that they come across wave function collapse. I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to that. Uh, so I've just seen the if you discretize time. Um, so, we might be at cross purposes. Um, so sure, of course, you could write a quantum dynamics according to which um, uh, to which a system uh, starts in lattice point one, then evolves over time tick one to a superposition across lattice points naught one two, then evolves to minus one through to three. Uh, so agreed, absolutely. Um, that's not going to give you something that's very close to dynamical systems we mostly see in application because if i the, the, the continuous time the hamiltonian that i tried to if, if you imagine what the, the, your discretized time is a snapshot of some hamiltonian process the hamiltonian spectrums won't, won't be able to be bounded below 
that's well that's not quite true because um those are isolated times go, go back to the Hegefeld theorem I was, I was quoting if, if you if you have a Hamiltonian that's um uh that's bounded below then the 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 the, the, the times at which the lattice state is going to be confined in that way are going to be just that it's just those discrete times and of course you could choose your um your time discretization to catch exactly those instances of time but at that point you start worrying that's an artifact of the way you set up the discretization i mean one wants to think that a discretization it, just as just as space is really just, just as taking space is really continuous is probably trusting our microphysics too far and, th and things should be robust against discretization likewise we don't want to depend too much on artifactual features of a particular discretization we ought to be able to think if you fuzz up the discretization then the conclusion you want doesn't change too much but i, you know, I, take, I take the point of course it's not it's, it's not that you can't construct genuinely discrete time um uh dynamics for which something like this genuinely holds it's it's, it's more the case that for the um, perhaps I should say the non-computational applications of the theory, um, one by and large isn't running into them. Okay, and any yes, other questions? Allow me to, to comment on, mm. that, on, on that, if, if I may, Please. is that uh, I have found it very useful to set up what I call toy models mm. in which both space and time are discretized and <clears throat> the time evolution is just a unitary transformation from one configuration to another um, and and this helps in interpreting or or getting to the bottom of certain quantum paradoxes i was just discussing this recently with uh, david um, <clears throat> snoke in terms of upshur's uh, paradox you're perhaps familiar with, with Upshur's uh, paradox? Uh, I'm not sure I am, if you're not by that name. Okay, well, <laughs> no point in, in, in bringing it all up now. I'll send you I'll send you email with, with references. But my point is, if you're a sloppy physicist, then you can build toy models and work on them for insights. Mm. Um, I'm not sure philosophers have that liberty. Um, it depends who you're talking to. I mean, I think... Um... Uh, different people have, have preferences in different directions. I mean, I, I certainly agree that um, it's very important not to get tricked by infinite dimensional stories. Um, infinite dimensions in physics tends to be a convenient way of idealizing finite. Um, that said, I, I do think it's important here that the, um, uh, the, 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 the there are some ways in which lattice dynamics can be um, uh, can be misleading here. I think. I mean, if you um, if, if, you, if, you, if you try building a, this is like an expansion, I guess what I was saying, Jeremy, if, if you try building a lattice dynamics that um, uh, that um, uh, just say jumps from one, from zero to zero plus one to zero plus one plus two and so on and, sp and spreads out in a nice friendly way um, with discretized time and discretized space. And then you imagine I'm discretizing and asking, okay, what's the continuum time story, leave space disc discretized that gives rise to to that nice friendly spreading around, then what it actually looks like is it kind of splurges out a bit and then splurges back down to the, the two points and then splurges back out again and splurges back down to the three points. Um, and if you if you even decided, okay, suppose I wanted to modif my, modify my discretization to, to look at a finer grained um, separation, then you'd find that it's, you, you didn't keep the property for, the, for those subsequent steps. So, so I think I think there's a well, it, uh, yeah, model, modeling and toy models is an art as much as a science. I mean, there's no way of advancing mm -hmm. strict rules as to how to do it. Um, I, I mean, the, the place where the place actually where I originally started thinking of Hegefeld's theorem here was um, more in the way philosophers were talk, so certain metaphysicians were talking about um, uh, definiteness and indefiniteness, and they were trying to work out a semantics of this. And and the kind of picture of the physics they had in mind was something like the way a system might work is it might start definitely located here and then a bit later it might be definitely located here and then a bit later it might be definitely located there and so i think it's quite important to notice that um uh realistic particle dynamics doesn't look like that and 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 it's not that it doesn't look like that as the, the fact it doesn't look like that is not an artifact of the um of, of the infinite um of you know of, of the improper eigen states or infinite dimension hilbert space or something it's it's something relatively robust about the dynamics What's the robustness in play? I think it's, as I say, I think it's basically the sort of Hegefeld 
um, result that bound spectrums that are bounded below are not friendly to dynamics that doesn't do this kind of thing. Um, I mean, the, I don't ask me to reproduce the math. It's, it's, it's a, in some ways, it's just the same as the sort of an, analytic function story from earlier. It's a bit related. I don't know if you know the um, the, the the no clock theorem in um, in some bits of quantum gravity. It's the it's sort of same sort of structure as that. I don't think. Oh. So if you want if you want to build a quantum clock, then ideally your clock just ticks in a nice friendly way. It's here and then it's here and then it's here and then it's here. Um, you can't build you 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 can't have a spec you can't have a Hamiltonian spectrum bounded below that delivers that for you. It's always going to have some probability of taking a step backwards. Thank you. I don't know if anyone has to to head out, but if they have more questions, go ahead. But I I enjoyed listening to all of that discussion. Yeah. All right. I think that's the end of our session. David, thank you so much. It was really great. Thank you, David. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. It's a, yeah. di a different set of questions from the sort I get giving this sort of talk to a, to a philosophy audience. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Yeah. Hope to have you visit in person soon, too. Or we can hope, can't we? <laughs> Maybe the end's starting to be inside. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.